Well, today we are in the final part, all right, a little bit sad, we're in the final part of a series through James 1 called Real. And in this series, really what we've done is we've spoken the not-so-fun, not-so-happy-to-hear truth that we all face trials in life, everybody. In fact, you faced one this past week. Maybe it was a large one, maybe it wasn't so large a one. Can I give you a little, little sneak peek into next week? Another one's coming. <laughs> I know. We're, welcome to the exchange. We're here to fill you up with positive and encouraging news, okay? Uh, buckle up for next week. Man, it, the reality is, it's all of us. And Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble. Like, it's coming, guys. Like, and so in this series, we're just asking and trying to shape ourselves to go, how can we not let it surprise us, but how can we change our perspective on those difficult moments of life and rather let it sanctify us, let it grow us to be more like Jesus? And so the question has been, how do we have true faith Real faith, not Sunday morning and it ends when we walk out the door faith, but how do we have true faith when life gets real? And so for the last time, turn with me to James chapter 1. James chapter 1 is where we're going to be today. If you don't have a uh, copy of Scripture, we'll put verses on the screen for you to follow along. Now, if you're tracking along, it's taken us four weeks, okay, four weeks just to get through James chapter 1. Um, And just a little sneak peek, it's going to take us actually the rest of the year to make it through the handful of chapters in the book of the James. In the book of James, and you're like, man, why? What's taking so long? Why are you dragging your feet, bud? Well, here's the deal: because the point for us, we believe, is not to make it through the Bible, but for the Bible to make it through us. All right. Some of you like that. Some of you were like, I don't know what he was talking about. Well, here's the deal. Man, we want the word to work on us, okay? And that's what's actually going to happen today. So today we pick up in verse 22, where we've left off in James chapter 1. We're going to make it all the way through the end. James 1, 22, let's start there. Here's what scripture says. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, but it do what it says. Now let's just stop right there. And some of you are like, well, that's why you can't make it through. You read one verse and now you already started to talk. Well, that's the deal, okay? James starts today with perhaps the simplest, but yet perhaps the most convicting and applicable verse of the whole chapter. He says, don't get caught being people who just listen to what God says through his word, but actually do what he says. Don't just listen. And so out of this thought, I'm going to give you one bottom line truth for today, and then we're just going to circle it and circle it again and circle it again so that you remember it. The goal of following Jesus isn't to hear, but to obey. The goal of following Jesus isn't to hear, but it is to obey. Hear me, church. We aren't called to just be hearers. We aren't called to just be believers, but we are called to be doers. In fact, what James says here, here's the warning flag. He says, when you only listen to the word, you actually begin to deceive yourself. I might take it a step further from James, and I would say we also become deceiving to the lost and broken and hopeless world around us. Perhaps the greatest tragedy of our Bible Belt church on every corner culture that has caused so much of the world to doubt the validity of so-called Christians is that we are fairly good at hearing. We go to church, we own Bibles. We are decent at believing. Most people would say, I believe in God, your coin says, in God we trust. But we are often very mediocre at best in our doing. And that means living it out 24 7, 365. You see, it's easy, think about it, it's easy at this moment in history, in modern America, to hear the word. Like, it's easier than ever before in history. Like, you listen to podcasts and audible books, and you can listen to basically any preacher, probably in the nation or in the world, almost like this. Just pull up YouTube, right? Or you got your sermon that you listen to on podcasts because you like them better than you like me. I see you, okay? I have people, believe it or not, I know it's like three, but like I have people who come to me sometimes and they say, oh, I love listening to your sermons on podcasts. Oh, we listen to your messages on YouTube. And my response, I don't say it, but I want to say it, my response typically is, that's awesome. Do you do what it says? Because the goal of following Jesus isn't just to hear, but it is to obey. We've kind of like gotten to a point in history where we have an obsession with information intake 
but I'm not quite as sure that our obsession is as strong with do what God says. You see, the point today, listen, the point is not hearing, it's not feeling, it's not showing up or taking notes or mooing at the good parts. Mmm, right? That's how white people say amen, okay? The point is not posting verses on your social media channels, but the point is living it out. It's application. In fact, the progression that James is laying out here, just to make it like real simple in the outline, is hear, believe, do. Hear, believe, do. How do we hear? Well, we hear in moments like this, okay? That's why we gather around the Word every seven days, We hear when we personally engage Scripture, which I'm hoping is an application point of your life, that like you read the Word, you don't have to have me to help read the Word, or you gather with other people in spiritual community, in an e-group, in a life group, with a co-worker who loves Jesus, you hear the Word, then what? We believe it as it begins to sink into us. God, reveal to me, teach me, grow my faith, and then what? And then we live it out in the way that the Word resonates through us because we've heard it and we believe it. You know what Scripture says? It says, even the demons believe the word of God. So you're like, man, I'm a believer. Awesome, cool, you're on the level of a demon, okay? Didn't say you should call your spouse that, but I'm just saying that's what the word says. Even the demons believe it, but you know what they failed to do? They have failed to submit to the lordship of Jesus and to do what he says. Hear, believe, do. Um, At my house, we give my kids instructions on things that we expect them to do around the house. Not sure if y'all are into that at your house, okay, but we try to exercise that at my house, okay? One of those things is, hey, kids, you're responsible to put up your clothes, okay? Like, you're responsible to put up your laundry. So I want you to imagine with me that, like, I look at my kids one morning, and I say, hey, kids, I'm asking you today to put up your clothes, like, put your laundry up where it goes, well, I come in at the end of the day, I'm like, hey guys, what, how, how you doing with what I asked you to do this morning? They say, oh dad, like the moment that we heard the word, we went to our rooms and we actually began to memorize the word. Put up your laundry, laundry, put it up. We memorized a couple of different ways to say that. We, we wrote some songs about what you asked us to do. We sang that, called some friends over. We circled around the laundry in our room, talked about the laundry, okay? Dad, did you actually know we studied a little bit? We found out that most of our clothes are made with 100% rayon because we don't like cotton, but the cotton t-shirts that we do wear, Dad, that cotton was growing right here in the state of Mississippi. Come on, Dad. Like, did you know that, Dad? Did you know that? And I would look at my kids and I would say, the question is, guys, Did you put up your laundry? And in so many ways, that's the picture of the modern American church. We hear it, we circle it, we sing it, but God is asking us today, are you doing it? Are you living out what I've asked? The goal of following Jesus is not to hear on Sunday, but is to obey every day. Now, go back to James chapter 1. I promise I'll preach all the way through it. Pick up with verse 23. It says, Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. Verse 25. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. So James takes this idea of not just hearing, but doing. He gives us an analogy of something that we do every day. Every single one of us got up this morning and looked into a mirror, right? Okay. When I say that, there's always the person that's like, no, like, I actually, I didn't look in the mirror. And we can tell, okay? You might think about, maybe pray on that. Maybe that's what God's telling you to do today, all right? But most of us, we got up and we looked into a mirror. And he says, anyone who listens but doesn't obey is like someone who looks at themselves in a mirror and then walks away and forgets what they look like. He's drawing this to this picture of hearing and doing. So I know that you never do that with my well-put-together messages, that you never hear and then walk away and forget what we've talked about. But maybe some people at some other churches that we might know, they do that, right? God says, hey, be aware. The goal is not to intake what you hear, but it is to live out what I impress upon your life. 
See, the Bible is like this. We could add to James' analogy. The Bible is like a map, and it's a mirror. Now, it's a map to guide you, right? To align you, to show you God's purposes, and then to line you up with them. But it is also a mirror. And it's a mirror in this way that it helps us begin to see the problem. And the problem, most often, is me and you, right? When you realize that you don't have it all together, and we hold the mirror up to our lives, and you realize you don't have it all together, then guess where you are? You realize you are spiritually bankrupt, and you're at a perfect place to go, now I need a Savior. Not just when I was in third grade, and I trusted God, and I checked a card, but I need a Savior daily. Daily, I need him in my life. The point of the mirror, catch this, the point of the mirror is not the mirror itself, but it's that it points back at you and me to show us what's wrong with you or me. So I brought a mirror as a visible reminder today. Every single one of us, as I said, got up this morning and looked in the mirror. What do we do? We look in the mirror and we assess the situation, correct? And many of us, like me, go, uh-huh, a lot of work to do right there, right? Okay, guess what? We, no, no sane person ever looks in the mirror, assesses the situation, and then redirects the responsibility for the situation that they see. Babe, we're really going to have to get some new pillowcases. You can't believe what it's doing to my face, right? No, what do we do? We have to own the responsibility. Every person looks in the mirror for the same amount of time. You know that? Every person looks in the mirror for the same amount of time. You know what that amount of time is? As long as it takes to get it right. For some of us, that's maybe longer than others, right? But we look in the mirror as long as it takes to get it right. And we can find ourselves sometimes, though, evaluating the mirror. Stay with me in this. We can find ourselves evaluating the mirror. If I was to evaluate this mirror, I'd be like, wow, it's kind of shiny. All right, a little dusty there on the bottom. It's flexible, right? Like that. Light, well, it doesn't work. Battery's not in there, okay? Like, good, simple, small, clear. We evaluate the mirror. And sometimes even in the same way as really good church-going Christians, we can begin to evaluate the mirror of the Word, right? And we say things like, well, I really kind of prefer the New Testament rather than the Old Testament because it's kind of hard to understand or I don't really know what that means. Like, I really prefer these kind of books rather than those kind of books. I mean, I like James, but kind of got in my business. I'd probably rather talk about parables. They're kind of more fun to talk about Bible study, right? And here's the deal. We can find ourselves evaluating the mirror when the application is no, the mirror is called to evaluate us. The question is not, do you study your Bible? But the question is, does your Bible study you? And what does God say to you when you interact with his living and active word? We hold it up like a mirror, James 1, and it reveals some things about us. And then what do we say? Now, what do I do about that? So that I'm not just a hearer, I'm not just an absorber, but I'm an obedient disciple of living this out. Here's what Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 says. For the word of God is alive and active. It is sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. Look at this. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. I can't tell you the number of times over the last 11 years where I've had somebody come up to me at the end of one of our Sunday gatherings, and I preach, and they'd be like, Man, like, I can't believe what you said. Like, it was like, it was like you knew what happened with my world this week. Like, you were speaking right to me. And it's like, how did you even know what was going on in my situation? And listen, the reality is, I don't know what went on in your week. You didn't write me a letter. You didn't send me your weekly agenda in an email. But you know who does know? The Lord knows. And Hebrews says, right there in chapter 4, that he knows you, and his word is not a history book, but his word gets in your story, and it targets the heart. It divides joint and marrow. It penetrates to the soul. And you know what it always calls us to do? To change, to live it out. It's going to sharpen or encourage or challenge something in us. And being a Christ follower today, if you haven't heard it yet, being a Christ follower isn't just about hearing the word preached or reading it on a Monday morning at the breakfast table, but it's about obeying the truth and what you've heard preached. It's kind of like, let me paint it this way, it's kind of like having a gym membership, right? 
Has anyone ever gotten in shape from simply grabbing the $1, $10 deal at Planet Fitness? Anybody just like, you got the gym? Like, no one, okay, listen, no one has ever come up to you and be like, bro, like, you looking good, man. You looking swole. Like, you, right, you, you, what you been doing? You've been working out. And you looked at them and said, no, man, I really haven't really been doing anything. I hadn't lifted, no bench press, nothing. But I got the membership, and boom, this happened. Like, come on, get you some, right? No, you don't say, why? Because that's not how it works. The goal isn't to hear and absorb, but it is to do, to live it out. In fact, every week as we gather around the truth of Scripture in our gatherings, we really ask three questions as we try to teach. What, like, what does it say? So what? What does it mean? Now what? What do we do? What do we do with what we've heard? The goal every week as we speak our final declaration, now we go and live as the church is what? Is that we would go and be doers in the world. In fact, doer of the word, how about this? Doer of the word is a really good description or definition of disciple of Jesus. Doer of the word. Oh, I know my friend John that I work with, he doesn't just go to church, he actually does the word. The word is in his life. And James says in verse 25, maybe you caught it a while ago, he says the perfect law, the word of God, gives, watch this, beautiful freedom. Oh, that's a good word. Did, did you realize that? Like, did you realize that, like, not just listening, not just reading on your own, but living out what the Word says, that it brings freedom? Because you know what? Maybe it's not you, but there's a lot of people in our culture, and here's what they've thought for a long, 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 long time. Well, that book, what they say, where you go to church, man, that's really just a whole lot of do's and don'ts. And it will restrict my life from any happiness, any pleasure, any joy, anything that I really want. And James says, now let me turn that upside down because obeying the perfect law of the Lord gives freedom. What freedom are you talking about? Well, the freedom to know that you're doing what you were created to do. There's not a better thing to live for than to walk in that, to hear, to believe, and to do. And often when we think about obedience from the Bible, we think about right and wrong. Isn't that how we talk about it in our culture? Well, they're good, but they're bad, right? And, and James, Scripture is saying, no, don't think about obedience in right and wrong or good or bad, but think about it in life or death. What do you mean? Well, the enemy who calls us to disobedience, what have we said the last few weeks? He only comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy, we said it a few weeks ago, desire in the wrong direction always leads to what? To death and destruction. But Jesus, John 10, he came that he says, those who might follow, those who might listen and obey my commands would have life and have it abundantly. Can I just give you a little, like, little good news today? That doesn't just mean heaven. Like ab Abundant life, I believe, starts now when we obey the Spirit of God and the Word of God in us. It changes the way that we live. And it brings a freedom to how we live. In fact, James ends verse 25. I'm going to read the last phrase from verse 25. He says, the one who doesn't just hear but obeys, here's what he says, will be blessed in all they do. I don't fully know what that means. I don't necessarily think that means a new $500,000 house, but you know what? I want to be more towards that. I, I want my life to look more like that. And James says, well, here's how you get there. Don't just listen. Don't just soak it in. Don't just check the spiritual Christian box and say, did that. But you do. You do what it says. You let it change the way that you live. Why? Because the goal of following Jesus isn't to hear, but it is to obey. Now, that leads us to one really big, important application question. You ready? What is God telling you to do. That's it. So extravagant though. What is it? What is God telling you? As a high school student, as a single mom, as a grandparent, what, what is God telling you to do? If, you, if you're a follower of Jesus and you are hearing, pretty good at that. You're believing, decent at that. And he's calling you to do, what is it? 
that God's speaking in you. Because you know what? Here's, a, here's an amazing part. He speaks to all of us if we listen. And chances are for some of you, the moment that you heard today was about obedience, like doing, not hearing, he brought that thing up that y'all been talking about. You and him, that he's been prompting you on. You're like, oh, God, we will. I'll get to it, I promise. Right? And today he's just saying, like, what, what is he telling you to do? For some of you, like, it's like he's finally telling you, like, no, I'm calling you to not do life alone. I'm calling you to connect your life with a life group where you can get to know some other people. I know you're an introvert, but you can get to know some other people and you can grow in your faith. I'm just telling you to do it. That's what I'm asking you to do. For some of you, it's like, man, you know Jesus. You know a little bit of the word. He's calling you to, to launch one, like to grab some other people, circle them up, disciple them, e-group, life group, at your workplace. Just do it. Like, don't make excuses. He's saying, like, you heard me. Now do it. For some of you, God's calling you to forgive that family member. For some of you, maybe he's calling you to get help for the addiction that you're bad on. For some of you, like, he's calling you to tithe. Woo, that's fun, isn't it, right? But he, he said it, so it's just up to us to do it. For some of you, God's calling you to be baptized, to publicly declare your faith in Jesus. Here, here's the deal. What is God telling you to do? You listen, you hear that, and then do you know what you do? You, you do it. <laughs> you do, it's, not, it's not hard. You do it. Why? Because the goal of following Jesus isn't just to hear, but it's to obey. And today I have like the really easy part because I just say it, <laughs> and then like we all have to actually do what God's calling us to do. Now, some of you, maybe you're going, well, I don't, I don't really know. Like, yes, I should obey. I don't fully know what that looks like. Well, I want to give you a few tips, okay? A few helpful pointers from the Word of God. You've got two verses left in James chapter 1, and in that is some things that God calls us to do. And so let's go back to Scripture. James chapter 1, and let's pick up in verse 26. It says, Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues, deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. Verse 27. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. James starts and he says, those who consider themselves religious. Can we just like all agree that that word, that thought of religious and religion kind of gotten a bad rap, right, in today's culture. James says there are actually two kinds of religion, two kinds of following Jesus. There's good religion and there's bad religion. James just explained the bad religion, right? He says it's those people who they go to church, they hear the word, they sit in Bible study, they talk about it, they say they memorize it, but they never do it. And he actually says here, your religion and your walk with God is useless if it doesn't translate into how you live. And unfortunately, many people, we could maybe even say, are deceived in their own heart regarding the reality of their walk with God. That's why James says, hey, don't, don't be deceived. You can be a good church-going person in the South and be deceived. So James closes out chapter 1 with some call to do. And he's going to give us three direct responses that we just read them. We're going to break them down real quick to be a doer of the word. Now, these, listen, these are not the only signs of obedience, but these are ones that the Holy Spirit prompted James to include right here as he called us to be a doer. And you go, well, why do we trust James? Like, where did James get this idea from? Well, I don't know for sure, but I'm going to go out there and say maybe he got them from his brother. Remember who his brother was? Some of you missed week one and week two. James was the half-brother of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So there's a chance that maybe James watched the life of God in flesh. And the Holy Spirit prompted James to include these three things right here. And so today, if you're going, well, like, I don't really know what's God telling me to do, well, then you can rest assured that these three are on the list. You ready? I'm going to give them to you. We'll, we'll highlight them for a moment. The first response, we'll say it this way, first response is to monitor your mouth. To monitor your mouth. I'm just reading from James. Verse 26, he said, Those who do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. What you saying, James? He says, if your tongue and your words are out of control, you've got double trouble. 
Because he says, you're deceiving yourself. And that church thing you do, that Jesus thing you proclaim to have, it's worthless. The Jews that James is writing to, um, they typically regarded giving and prayer and fasting and regular attendance at worship services that sound like any culture you've ever lived in, and the observance of holy days and feasts, they considered that as signs of someone who was religious. And James says, a better test of your spirituality or your religiousness was a person's control of his or her tongue. James says, monitor your mouth. Now, we're going to hang out all right, and talk a whole day about the power of the tongue in a few weeks because James talks about it. It'll be awesome. You don't want to miss that day. All right? But here's just a sneak peek of what James says. Let me fast forward to James chapter 3, verse 9. I'm going to read to you two verses. James 3, verse 9 says, With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. And out of the same mouth come praise and and cursing my brothers and sisters, this should not be. See, many of us have stood in worship gatherings, right, like today, and praised the Lord with our tongue, and then left this moment and caused great destruction and harm with the same thing we praised the Lord with. And James says, that ain't it. That's acting a little bit more like a hearer than a doer. So he says, monitor your mouth so that your words would only be an avenue of life and not an instrument of destruction. So what's God telling you to do? You can put this one definitely on the list. Okay? He's saying, monitor your mouth. Me, you, all of us. Now here's the second one. From verse 27, James calls us, we'll say it this way, to love with your life. To love, love others, if you will, with your life. Verse 27, James said, True religion is to look after orphans and widows in their distress. In essence, catch this, James says, don't get caught going to a church building on Sundays when it's convenient for your weekend, putting on your church face and telling everyone everything's fine in your life, mumbling some songs, nodding at the preacher, and going to lunch and calling yourself religious. He says, true religion moves to action. And part of that action is to love others with your life, particularly, particularly the most vulnerable, like orphans and widows. And I would just say to you that within the hundreds of people that make up our faith family, we have both of those. And if you are one of those, I would just say that we see you. And we hope that this would be a family, spiritual family, where you would belong, where you would not be alone, and you would find a place of hope and truth because the Lord loves you. And he thought about you even when he wrote his word. And so if you are a widow or a widower, we don't want you to feel alone in this new season or this new chapter of life that can feel very lonely. In fact, I mentioned it earlier, but man, we have some incredible life groups for men and women where there's other men and women who are trying to figure out what it means to love and follow Jesus and it would be a great place for you to be included where other people could pray for you and know your name and care for you. And we would want that for you. Scripture also calls us to look after orphans. Did you know that? An estimated 14 million children globally suffer from acute malnourishment. In fact, 45% of children's deaths worldwide are related to hunger causes. Every day, an estimated 10,000 children worldwide die from hunger-related causes. 700 children die daily from causes like dirty water and unhygienic living conditions. And buckle up for this one. It's also estimated that around 1 million children in the world are raped every day. Church, that's not okay. That should be on the front page of the newspaper. What some dumb politician said could be on page five, but that should be on it every day for three pages, just headlines. This is not okay. And Jesus says, if you ignore this, you ignore me. 
And church, we've been called to be a part of that. And that's why one of the reasons that we as the exchange financially support for the last number of years, every month we support an organization in Swaziland, Africa called Hosea's Heart. And their sole mission, why they do what they do, is to take girls, orphans, out of sex trafficking and to put them in a safe place where they are loved and they are provided for and they are taught about the grace and the unconditional love of a loving Heavenly Father. And you're a part of that. We're also a part of a network of churches that help support um, the Baptist Children's Village. Maybe you've heard of that. It's here locally. Children's Village actually has seven different campuses across our state and has existed for over 120 years, and they serve around 200 orphans every single year. What do they do? Well, they provide them a place to be, belonging. They meet physical needs. They raise them up. They put parents in their life. They teach them most of all about the good news and the hope of Jesus, and then their goal is to connect them with a forever family. And my family has been forever impacted by the generosity and the goodness of what God has done through the Baptist Children's Village. In fact, this picture right here is a picture of the day that my daughter Kate left the Baptist Children's Village for the last time after living there for three years, and God changed her last name to May. I'm telling you that God put that on the list. What is he telling you to do? Well, he's calling us to serve the widows and the orphans. He's calling us to love with our life. What does that mean for you? I don't know. I'm not trying to be the Holy Spirit, but maybe for you that means that you're called to foster. Maybe that means that God's calling you to adopt, like many have in our faith family. At a minimum, I think he's calling us to give. At a minimum. And that may mean like just starting to faithfully tithe to God's work through the exchange so that we can keep being a part of stuff like that. Or maybe that means for you and your family, man, that you take on $43 a month. Like you do without one meal at Logan's so that you can take a child through somebody like Compassion International and you can begin to fund and support their life kind of like my house does with that kid on our refrigerator named Alejandro. God's calling us to it, to love with your life. Put it on the list. And then he wraps up with one last part of verse 27. If we're going to be a doer, not a hearer, he says, keep yourself from being polluted by the world. And here's how we'll say the final response. He's called you to protect your heart from pollution. To protect your heart from pollution. Some translations, maybe your translation says it this way, to be unstained or unspotted by the world. Can we just acknowledge today, guess what? The truth is, you don't have to go looking for the pollution of the world. Don't have to wake up tomorrow and try to seek it out. No, but you know what you do have to do? You have to wake up daily with the Spirit of God in you to protect your heart from the pollution of the world. Now, don't miss this, because this is who we are as a church. Scripture doesn't call us to retreat from the world. We are in the world, on mission, but we are not of the world and to protect your heart from the pollution in it. In other words, let me just sum it up very simply like this and let the Holy Spirit fill in the blanks. What you listen to matters. The Spotify playlist that only you have, that you're like, it's kind of my freedom jams. Just saying. What you watch and intake matters. What, who you hang with matters. How you handle your money, how you handle God's money, correction, matters. He says, protect your heart because the pollution is real and man, it will get all over you and all up in you. So what's God telling us to do, church? Well, he's telling us to protect your heart from the pollution of the world, to love others with your life, and to monitor your mouth. That's kind of a weighty list there on top of whatever he told you before, right? How in the, how in the world would we ever do that? Because that's hard. Like, how in the world would we do that? Well, I might expand out the question to our whole series just to say, how in the world would we live with true faith when life gets real? Because it is right now or it will be tomorrow. How do we do that? Well, James makes it about as simple as possible. It starts and it ends with understanding that following Jesus isn't just about hearing. Following Jesus doesn't end today with, and you are dismissed. 
No, in fact, in many ways, that's when it starts. That we're called not just to hear, but to obey. Thanks for joining us online today. We gather not just to sing songs and hear the teaching of scripture, but we also gather so that we might be changed to live more like Jesus. Through our time today, we pray that you are challenged and encouraged to think about your own life and how you may or may not be living out Jesus' command to follow him. We want you to know that we are available and ready to pray for and encourage you as you seek to know God and what it means to live in relationship with him. To get a conversation started with one of our ministry team members, you can simply text your first name to 601-397-6111. Our ministry team would love to pray for you and help you in any way. You can also find reading plans and other resources to help you take next steps in your faith on our website, theexchange.cc. As we close out our time today and prepare to scatter as the church, let's speak out our declaration together. We believe the great exchange took place when Jesus, who had no sin, became sin for us so we could know God. We exist to see people exchange their old life for new life in Christ and live out their purpose. Christ's love compels us to exchange ideas for truth. God's word is our standard. Selfishness for serving, we will serve others. Pleasing for reaching, we will share our faith. Keeping for dispersing, we will make disciples. Forgetting for celebrating, we will praise God. We are the church.